be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his table, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, from whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'm going to pray for us. Father, pray that you would soften our hearts to the word that you have us have for us this morning. May we see the reality of who we are as well as your overwhelming grace and forgiveness that you offer. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, what's striking about this passage is the passage right before it, Jesus is talking to his current generation. And he's trying to understand because when John the Baptist came, eating no bread, drinking no wine. They said he had a demon. And when the Son of Man came, obviously referring to himself, says, you know, I came eating and drinking, and you call him a drunkard and a glutton and a friend of sinners. God is moving into the world, speaking to people, speaking to generations. And generations say, no, this doesn't quite fit. This doesn't quite fit what we would prefer. We kind of want God to fit our perspective, to fit our expectations. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you want to know who he claims to be? Or do you want Jesus to fit into perspective that you might have? And when you're possibly not open to see who Jesus really is, we end up missing it missing the most important part of who Jesus is. The church can spend a lot of time and attention on morality in the world and politics and world issues, and obviously those are important, but you can miss the central reason of why Jesus came. He came to bring joy and peace because of the forgiveness of sins that he offers. We get joy and peace because of his Forgiveness. Well, let's look at this. Three main characters, Jesus, and then Simon the Pharisee, and then this woman. So Simon invites Jesus to dinner. And Jesus has been doing ministry, he's been preaching, he's been healing, and he's getting a following. Jesus is trendy. You know, he's getting popular. People are hearing about it. And Simon's like, I, this guy might be a prophet. I'm going to invite him to dinner. And Jesus goes. You know, Jesus is 
welcoming to not only the outcasts, to those who are distraught, as well as those in power and those who are in significant leadership position, the Pharisees, Jesus attends. And in many ways, their interaction is cur courteous, but obviously, as the story goes, it's uh, Jesus is trying to reach Simon as well as this woman. So just to let you know, this public dinner that they're having, uh, culturally scholars have, have come to discern that those dinners were public. So you would have the Pharisee Simon having a bunch of people over and they would be those who were invited to eat in a U-shaped the table was really low, and they lounged. There were no chairs. They were on pillows, and their feet were sort of angled backwards. I, don't, I guess it's comfortable. It seems a little <laughs> awkward. I don't know. It's like, how are you? But that's, you know, you've probably seen images of this. This is how they ate, I guess. That's, that's what they did, and it's probably put in that way so that they could lounge for a while. They're lingering. Different cultures American culture, my experience, you eat fast. Other cultures can linger at dinner for several hours. Uh, and this is, probably, this is what they were doing. But it's public, so you have an important person. They're having a conversation at the table, and others from the outside can be in the outer, uh, the, the outer part of that U-shape to listen into the conversation. They're not eating. They're just welcomed in and out to hear this conversation. So then this sinful woman comes in. Now it's unclear what her sins are, whether it's adultery, whether she actually is a prostitute, but her reputation and I suspect and how she's dressed and the way she looks identified as a sinful woman. Now her coming in is not, the reason why they say it's a public dinner, otherwise she wouldn't have been able to get in, but she gets in Maybe somewhat objectionable, but nobody says anything, obviously, and she has an alabaster jar of ointment, which is really a perfume. So they're having a conversation, typical dinner, whatever happens there, and the woman planned to go in and anoint Jesus' feet. She obviously had some interaction with Jesus. She had heard about him, maybe even heard him preach, heard him, heard him about the miracles, and she goes and she has this perfume. She wants to anoint his feet. But as she approaches, she just starts uncontrollably weeping. This man who accepts her and loves her, and she just is undone. Uncontrollably, tears pouring down on Jesus' feet, she undoes her hair and wipes the tears. And then she's kissing his feet. Now this kiss, as used in other places, it's a strong verb. It kind of is similar to the father when the lost son comes back and the father embraces him and kisses him. Or when Paul has a fair, Apostle Paul has a farewell to these people he's been ministering to for several years and now he's going to leave them and they kiss her heart is broken. Either it's a, it's a mourning over her sin and thankfulness of his receptivity and forgiveness. And imagine the scene and how uncomfortable it is, right? It's, you know, now Simon, who's the host, is now experiencing this. And I imagine they're no longer talking and there's a hush. You know, it, it's a little like, you know, when you're in, a conversation with a group of people that all of a sudden somebody shares too much information, you know? It's a little bit too much we really didn't need to know. And it causes this awkwardness, like how do you deal with it? I don't, you know. It's awkward, right? She's filled with emotion and they're just having a casual dinner. And imagine how Simon felt now that this woman's getting attention. And it's like, Simon, when you invite somebody important like Jesus... It says something about you that Jesus is willing to come, and he's maybe a little puffed up. We don't know. He has this big dinner. Of course, Jesus is the center of the tension, but so is the host. You're feeling pretty good about yourself. It's kind of like, this is kind of embarrassing, but a couple years ago, I'm on Twitter, not very much, but I've started following this seminary professor, and then... 
I notice he's following me. I'm like, oh, he must have seen my latest post. Maybe he's even listening to my sermons, right? You know, I'm all excited. Like, I'm, like his attention means so much. And then I'm like, what? Well, i got to post something really sharp, really intelligent, really nuanced, really, you know, he'll be impressed. And then I come to happen to notice a week later, he's no longer following me. <laughs> I'm like, what happened? What did I say? What did I do? I can't believe that I was that caught up in caring about that. Anyway, but Simon is probably, now all of a sudden, the attention is elsewhere. Attention is on this woman. And I don't know the the decorum of that public dinner and what's expected in the etiquette, but it's completely broken at this point. It is a remarkable scene. Sound of her uncontrollably weeping, the sight of her at Jesus' feet, and then the smell of the perfume filling the whole room. It's extraordinary. Extraordinary. And Simon's response? Jesus may not be a prophet because he doesn't realize who's touching his feet. He sees her differently doesn't fit the expectation of a prophet. God is doing something where it doesn't fit what I would expect. And I imagine if Jesus comes and starts hanging around with people that that we would think he wouldn't hang out with, people who we might perceive as immoral or against God's ways, and now he's hanging out with those kind of people. But the one thing we begin to realize is the difference between God and us is God doesn't think he's us. Do you, you get that? <laughs> He doesn't think he's us. But sometimes we, do. we don't think we're God, but we think we know what God should do. We know what God is like. Sometimes we really need to dig into the scriptures to discover who he's revealed himself to be. Simon does not know, does not know Jesus, does not know what he would be like. And here, Jesus answers him, which is striking because Simon didn't say anything, but Jesus answers him. The thought is that Jesus, in other passages, it says, knowing their thoughts. Jesus knows his thoughts. It's more than just mere perception. It's kind of like mind reading, kind of. You know, I once heard a pastor stay in front of the congregation that he could read minds. And I have that gift as well. No, I don't have that gift. (laughs) How manipulative that is, right? Can you imagine somebody saying, I can read minds? This pastor actually said it. But anyway, Jesus knows our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. He knows Simon. So what does he do? He tells a simple parable. There's a money lender who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. Denarius is actually a uh, day's wage. So roughly, it's a year and a half wages to two months wages, or I don't know how much people make, but any $200,000 versus $20,000. Think of it that that way. And debts in Scripture is, uh, is really a metaphor for sins in many ways. Of course, we pray the f- prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this moneylender cancels both, and he asks, who showed greater love? And Simon might notice he's not sure where this is going, but he answers correctly. He says, I suppose the one who owed more. He grudgingly answers, waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. And what does Jesus say? Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? He hasn't seen her. Well, yeah. You know what? He's seen her and has already decided about her because he sees what she looks like. He sees the reputation 
And that's all he needs to know. Do we do that sometimes? We see somebody who looks a certain way, maybe behaving a certain way in a moment, and that's all we need to know. It's all the information we need. Something that triggers us to prejudge. We need to see Christ through Christ's eyes. And what does Christ see? He says, look, when I first came in, you had no water for my feet, but now she's been wetting my feet with her tears, wiping them with her hair. When I came in, you didn't even give me a kiss, and now this woman has not stopped kissing my feet. When I came in, you didn't put oil in my head, and now this woman has put expensive perfume on my ointment, on my feet. Do you know, she's been a better host than you have, Simon. It's kind of what he's saying. Now, just from what I understand culturally, it wasn't expected that Simon had to do this. It wasn't an obligation. It wasn't being rude by not doing these things. But he showed no affection, no kindness towards Jesus. No real devotion and understanding who he was who was coming to his dinner. And this is a question for us. Are we like Simon or are we like the woman? Now, we may not be, you know, Simon's a religious leader, somewhat proud in general as they generalize about Pharisees. So, you know, as if you've got God figured out. You know how God works. Or we might be somewhere in between go to church, you know, Jesus, we invite Jesus to dinner, we invite him at certain points and we go our way. Or we like the woman. And what does this mean? It's because those who have been forgiven little loves little. Those who have been forgiven much loves much. And, and, well, The woman clearly is a sinner. She has many sins, so she's greatly forgiven. Why is that to her advantage? It's not the fault of the Pharisee. He just sinned less. I don't think that's what it's saying. I think what it's saying is the Pharisee is unaware of his sins. Therefore, unaware of the great offer of forgiveness. He's lacking gratitude. And sometimes love of money or subtle pride is just more, it's more hidden and even more significant than outright immoral behavior. But the Pharisees had impressed others with their public religious acts, but God was not impressed at all. It's the very nature of Christ himself to rebuke pride and draw near to those with a humble, broken spirit. And sometimes our culture could pride strength in such a way that it keeps us from being broken before God, and that's the posture we need to have. So you know there's cities, and I don't know there's many cities that have done this after a tragedy, and Boston did it with Boston Strong, you know, after the tragedy and the, and the marathon. And, and I get that. You know, you don't want that. The terrorists or what happened to break you. You want to be strong. But sometimes strength is weeping uncontrollably out of joy that you are forgiven. Broken men and women don't care who finds out about their sin. There's nothing to protect, nothing to lose. They can love much because they've been forgiven much. And we all have a tremendous debt before God. And this is why the good news is so rich, so good, and the woman gets it because she knows the bad news. It's right before her. She knows that she is a sinner. read a verse this past week in my reading, my reading through the Bible in a year, and it was Psalm 7, verse 11, and it struck me, and I didn't know what to do with it. It says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. Sometimes we think, oh, God will judge at the end of time, or God judges at certain moments, that God's righteousness is his concern at all times. He's overseeing all human affairs. Everything we do, he sees. 
But you know what he also does? He forgives. What does he say? He turns to the woman and says, your sins are forgiven. Gone. And what's wonderful about this word, it's in the perfect tense, which means it's constant. It's not a one-time thing. You're living under the banner of forgiveness. You are forgiven. Must have overwhelmed her, this new life that has opened up to her, that she is free, she is forgiven. She doesn't need to work for it. She doesn't need to prove that, her good, that she is good. God has blessed her. Affirmation of forgiveness must have overwhelmed her soul. And you know what? There is a sense where she is almost seeing that. I mean, think about this. In her emotional affection and interaction with Jesus, it's so intimate, but it's so public. Everybody's seeing it. Because she's so fixed in understanding that's the only thing that matters. Jesus' welcoming of her and her forgiveness. And that's what we need. That's what we need in our hearts. That's what we need in general as a church. To see our sin, to be broken for God, and know his forgiveness. Somebody once said, like a house that needs to be rebuilt, our hearts need to be revived. A roof needs to come off so we have brokenness before God. Walls need to come down so we are broken towards each other. And of course, people are asking, who is this that forgives sins? And Jesus has an authority to forgive sins. It's a striking comment if you think he's just a prophet telling this woman her sins are forgiven. And then, she, then he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She has faith. She's the one in the midst of everybody there. I imagine there's other Pharisees there, religious leaders, people who have studied the law are curious about what Jesus is teaching and probably dialoguing back and forth. But what is this? this? This adulterous woman comes in and she gets Jesus. She knows what he's primarily about. One who has come to forgive. She's undone by that. You know, it's such, a, such an incredible reversal. You see throughout Luke where those in power don't get it, and those who are outcasts do. But I wonder, and Jesus is gracious, and I think there's an element of graciousness towards Simon. It strikes me that Simon is named here, and not just a Pharisee, not just a random person, but named here. And I wonder if Jesus is using this woman, hoping that Simon begins to get it. And I just, of course, we don't know, but I imagine years later, Jesus died, rose again, the church is growing. Simon goes to the marketplace and sees this woman with joy and peace, and she's laughing. And he remembers her, remembers the gracious rebuke by Jesus. And maybe he finally sees her like Jesus wants him to see her. We don't know. But how about you? Has there been a time where you've just broken over your sin as you see God's love and holiness? And how sweet that is. It's not this guilt-ridden angst. It's a reality of looking at your heart, who you really are, but knowing that God is loving and merciful, that you can approach the Lord, not because of your righteousness, but because of his mercy. You can live in a constant state of forgiveness, and that brings peace. So anything that happens, your peace is not going to be rattled because you know the Lord is for you. He's forgiven you. Well, how does this work out in scriptures? Real quick, there was a verse that I've been running through my mind the last couple of months. It's Galatians 2.20. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. I am dead to myself. Dead people don't get credit. It's not about me. You know, you're like a, a ghost in some ways. Somebody was saying, you know, my kids watch the show, Julie and the Phantoms. 
I try to watch the shows they watch just to see and, you know, connect. But anyway, there's these teenage boys who are actually ghosts, but they're in this band and they can't see him. Just like all the other movies that have ghosts, you know, it doesn't... But I think of it as me. Like, it's Christ in me. It's not me. It's not me getting credit. It's the antidote of spiritual pride and despair that it's Christ in me. Spiritual pride goes away when you recognize my performance does not distinguish me before God. And spiritual despair, well, what about all the things I've done, all the ways I've messed up? How can I go before God? Your sins are nailed to the cross. Jesus is so welcoming. It's not by your performance that you're right before God, but by faith in Christ. And it says, the life I, li I live now, I live by faith in, a, in Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a past tense. Jesus loved you. He gave himself for you. Because of that, because of what he has done, you can live in him by faith and have peace and grace. Just like if he, he went to the cross, he died for your sins, your sins are forgiven. It's a done deal. Whatever you do, you can't lose your salvation. Now, some people would say, well, this is crazy because then you can do whatever you want. <laughs> If he's always going to forgive you and it's the base of who you are, that doesn't make sense. And not to get into scripture, of course, refers to this. But in general, I would say somebody who knows Christ and his Holy Spirit is dwelling within that person, they will hate the wrongdoing that they do. They will be grieved by it. It's the nature of being a Christian. And of course, we all wrestle with this. But what a thought that in the midst of all of this, to have the faith like this woman had, to be willing to be broken for all and that before all, and her identity was no longer based in her reputation and what she has done, but her reputation, well, her identity is based on Christ and what Christ, how Christ has received her and ultimately what Christ will do for her, meaning going to the cross. You see, when Christ sees people, he sees what his powerful grace can do in their life. And sometimes we see so many different things. But sometimes, even in our own life, we're often not realizing how Christ sees us in light of a transforming grace and power and what Christ is offering us. It's great freedom and joy. And maybe, you know, I know we're Presbyterians and we're not going to be, all be weeping with emotion, but some emotion is not bad, right? You know, it's, if it's real, we can open up. And maybe it's private more than public, but again, it's more about where your faith is. Your faith and trust in what Christ has done for you might lead you to respond like that. But God can powerfully use broken-hearted, weeping men and women for his purposes. As Jesus is the center of your life, you want him to be active in your life. And you know what? You have great peace because of what he's done for you and the assurance of that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you know us perfectly, you know our thoughts, you know our hearts, you know us more than we know ourselves. You know all the ways that we think of you that are, that are good and true and others for whatever reason that are distorted. Lord, we want clear thinking about you and ourselves so that we would know you and your forgiveness and love. I pray for anyone here who maybe for the first time is considering what it means to know you, what it means to embrace incredible nature of your grace and forgiveness. I pray that you would be working powerfully. And I pray that we would only, Lord, by your Spirit reveal ways in which we need to admit that we should be broken before you. Pray 
uh, that you would give us that grace and mercy and that we would understand your love for us and we would be overwhelmed with joy. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray to this end. In Jesus' name, amen.